three, two, one. Okay. All right. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for attending our demo day for Learning Fuse. We're super excited for you all to view our presenters and what they have built. Um, and again, we want to thank you all for attending. Um, I'm Cass, by the way. I'm the program coordinator at Learning Fuse, and this is my colleague TJ. And he's the director of career services. And we were able to partner with Fairstream. Thank you very much um, to host uh, the, this event today or tonight. But yeah, so I'm just going to. All right, our first presenter is going to be Brian. Welcome, Brian. Awesome, yeah, so you're going to be presenting first today, so feel free to share your screen. Um, you'll have five minutes to present and we'll have around three minutes for questions. Okay, awesome. Uh, let me, oh wait, oops, I was about to leave by accident. Oops. Here we go. Wait, I think you guys are. Do you guys see the app or do you guys see the terminal? I see the numbers, the terminal. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why that's. Sorry about that. Let's see. Okay, this should be it. All right. Can you guys see the app? Yeah, on the phone, the mobile version, right? Yeah. Awesome. Perfect. So my name is Brian Bozigan, and I'll be introducing you to GG, otherwise known as Good Game. But to be honest, GG sounds a little bit cooler. And so pretty much what GG is, is that it's a social network for gamers created by a gamer. Growing up, I was always passionate about gaming. And I know there's like Instagram, Facebook, but to be honest, a lot of them have been crowded with like advertisements and things like that. So I just thought it would be a cool idea to turn my passion and just kind of make an application out of it. And so pretty much what it is, is that on GG, you're able to post your gaming highlights. Uh, this is the home screen. So as you can see, this is a Modern Warfare 2 kill cam. We're talking about El the Los Angeles Thieves, the esports team, Bowser. But what's cool about it is that, let's say we see this image for Jakota, or not Bob Hope, right? If we click Bob Hope's gamer tag, it will take us to his uh, user page. So you can see his avatar, his uh, gamer tag, and all of his postings. And so even for us, like if we're trying to find someone, but we can't really remember what their name is, but we know their name starts with like a J, you can type in J and there's like a live search feature that's running. And let's say that we're looking for someone that just doesn't exist, like Mr. T, then we'll get back no user found. And so to exit, all you have to do is hit the search button again or any of the bottom nav bar uh, buttons. And so the feature I'm gonna be showing, talking about today is the actual home feed, but to kind of show it better, I'm gonna be showing you a new posting too. So to make a new post, we click the top right button and you'll be introduced to the posting page. All you have to do is click upload file. For us, we're gonna upload this image right here and we're gonna give it a description of catch me on Twitch. Oops, sorry case, eh? But once I hit submit, What's going to happen is that I'm going to be brought back to the home page and you can see the actual posting is, uh, is posted there. And so even for us, like if you were to go to your profile page, you can see that's going to be the latest posting on your actual profile. And so just to kind of explain the code a little bit more, uh, for the actual navigation on the home screen on the app.jx, what we're actually doing is we're using hash routing to uh, go through the different viewpoints. So if we were to click account, messaging, home, or search, it's going to take us to that viewport. Uh, for the actual post form, what it's actually doing is we have an uh, event, a, a handle submit method that is listening to the description, which is going to be the form data. And on top of that, it's going to be listening, uh, watching for the actual file that's being uploaded. And then we're going to be making a fetch request with the post method. And so what we're going to be trying, what we're going to be doing is actually posting the image and the path to that image. And on top of that, you can see right here in the red, in the render, uh, this is the actual form that's being submitted. And to look at the back end of it, what's happening here is if we go to app.post, which is right here, 
we could see that we're getting descri the description uh, from the rec body. Uh, if there's no description, there will be an error that's sent. But what's interesting is that to get the actual image, what we're doing is that we're storing the image on the server, but we're saving the relative path to that image with a JavaScript middleware that's called Muttler. And so what we're doing is that on the Postgres SQL, we're actually saving the path to it to access it. And so with that, you can see that this is posted onto the DB. And coming back home to the home page, we have a method of get post, which is fetching, which is doing a fetch request, which is getting the post data and it's saving it to the state of posts. And so at first, post is just an empty array, but once it has all of the data, all of the data is in that array, which allows us to actually map through that. And with that, we can make an LLI for each of the postings, which is going to include the gamer tag, the user ID, the image, their description. And so even looking at that, what we can see is over here on the feed, what we're actually doing is we're selecting the post ID, the gamer tag, the photo ID, the user ID, the descriptions. But since they're from different tables, we're actually joining it together from the column of users to be able to get everything that we need. Because as you saw before, if you were to click on a user's uh, gamer tag, it takes us to their own account that we get their own profile that we can see. And so all of that is brought together by the home feed and all of the data that we're getting from it. And so pretty much that is the gist of my application. I am still currently working on it. I am, my stretch features are the messaging. Uh, I'm getting closer and closer to be, being able to create that. And on top of that, I'm making a, I'm working on the feature where users can actually make new accounts to actually join. And, uh, just to end it off, I just kind of want to share this one thing. So within the gaming industry, one of the most popular things are like Easter eggs within games. And so even for this, like this being a gaming application, I thought it would be fair enough to have an Easter egg. And so if you were to, if you were to open the app for the very first time, which we're going to refresh it. And if the first thing that you do was up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, DA. Which activates the contra title card, which is just a small little Easter egg. There's are a couple of extra ones, but to check those out, you have to visit the app itself. If you have any questions, please please feel free uh, to ask. I'll be happy, more than happy to answer. Awesome! Thank you so much, Brian. I always love the Easter egg. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> um. Let me, uh, yeah, TJ, if you see any questions that come through in the chat, definitely let me know. Uh, but yeah, definitely a great job. I'm just going to give it a little bit if there's any questions for Brian. And then uh, how long did it take for you to make this application, Brian? Uh, so from the begin, like the beginning with all of the planning, creating the figmas to this, it took me about like a week and a half to get the majority of it done. Uh, I'm still currently, as I'm working on the messaging feature to it, but the core concept is there already, which I mean, it's pretty awesome because even before starting to learn at Learning Fuse, I've always wanted to make like a gaming application. And so this is more like a passion project for me now. Awesome. That's really neat how like you have a project now that you are willing to and, you know, motivated to work on after the program too. Brian, this wasn't a question, but it did come from uh, the crowd um, wondering what uh, other Easter eggs you might have in store or be looking into. And if not, obviously you don't need to give away anything, maybe a hint or two. Uh, I'll just tell you one. So uh, the other ones you have to figure out. I'll, I'll have them in the GitHub. But uh, one of them is, is that we, I have a CSS spinner that if the app, like, for example, if you're loading on like 3G, that's super slow, instead of you being kind of frustrated and uh, kind of like, oh, why don't you load? Uh, it actually displays like a lightsaber fight that goes on while the data loads. Yeah. Very neat. That's a very cool Easter egg. And we'll definitely, <laughs> hopefully people are able to find it then. <laughs> awesome. Oh, uh, and then, yeah, TJ, do you want to go? 
I was just going to say, Brian, if you wouldn't mind posting your live link uh, to that in the chat later on on the fair stream, I think some people would definitely be interested in checking it out and saving it for later. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Thanks, Brian. Wait, I think we have uh, one more question uh, from Jacob. Plan what are your plans for hosting? And like, what does MVP mean to you? Uh, so right now it's being hosted on Heroku. Uh, there is some optimization that I'm going to do for it just so that it can load a little bit faster. And with MVP, I think for it to be like, MVP has to have like the basic CRUD, CRUD operations because uh, I think those are like the very essential parts to that, to whatever application that you're actually making. Uh, but yeah, I would say like, Based, meeting the requirements of like CRUD operations. Yeah, that would be MVP. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brian. And you can exit the Zoom and I'll be, uh, our next presenter will be Victor. And he'll be joining the Zoom in just a bit. All right, Victor, welcome. Thank you so much for being our next presenter. Um, are you ready to share your screen? Do I share it right now? Yeah, yes, please. Oh, yeah. Oh, wait, hold on. You are sharing your... Do I go in a different... Zoom. Oh, there we go. Very good. You're good. Uh, any archive, right? Yes. Excellent. All right. You may begin. Do I just say in, do I say in this Zoom? Yeah, yeah. Stay in the Zoom. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Victor Kalinkin, and I am a full stack web developer. Uh, I want to talk about one of the projects. Uh, Victor, if you've got the fair stream link open, just uh, make sure to mute that one and just keep on rolling and you'll be good to go. Okay, so it's good now? Yeah, you should be good. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Victor Klinken. I'm a full stack web developer and I'm going to talk about one of the projects I made during my time at Learning Fuse. And that's any, it's called Any Archive. And it's an anime and manga database for users who want to find and explore a uh, new anime series. So this project was built around the GCAN API. And that API pulls data from MAL, My Anime List, which is a website that's just a very large database on almost every anime and manga series ever made. So using that API, I basically have access to the same information. So one of the main features this project is made around is the search feature. So you just hit search. And then there's two types of search, term and season. So with term, we're just going to enter in just any phrase. We're going to go with Gundam. And then you can choose which medium. And a quick primer for those who don't know, anime means any animated series. So TV or movies. And then manga is just comics, anything that's like print on paper. So we're just going to hit search. And then we have a bunch of results pop up, anything that's related to the term. They all have images, they all have the title, they have some information. But if you're curious about more information, you just click the button and a modal is going to pop up and you can pop out of there. And then if you want to search for manga, just hit that button and then search again. and you got all the manga results. So this is term search, but there's also season search because anime series are released on a seasonal basis. So there's two options. You can get the latest and that's selected by default. That's gonna give you whatever is on air right now for summer of 2021. But I also let the user go back in time and go to any previous season all the way back to the 60s. So we're just gonna go spring of 1979. And here's everything that came out in that period. The other big feature is that if there's a series that you like or just wanna like remember, uh, you can just click on the star 
and it's going to go to your favorites list. And then all you have to do is just click on my list and it showed up and there was already one series there. And if you're like done watching it or you just want to remove it, you can just unfave it and it's gone. So that's, that's the gist of my application. And I want to talk about some of the code. So one of the main things with this project is I had to call the API with different search criteria. So for that, I'm using an XML HTTP request object. And that allows you to call the API with the different parameters. So whatever the search term gets entered in the box, and it's going to go sent to the API. And the API is going to respond with, with the results in a result array. And when you have the results array, uh, my project is going to go iterate all of them. And I'm going to use dynamic DOM creation to. Victor, do you, do you mind moving the mic a little bit closer? It started to get a little muffled for a second there. Kind of on the headset. Did the cord possibly come? Um... No. Is it okay? Getting a little better. Yeah. Okay. Roll on through. Sorry for jumping in is there. You'll, it'll be fine. We'll turn it up a little bit. Is this live? It is. Yeah. Okay. Just keep on going. Yeah. You're good. Yeah. So we're going to iterate all over the results array and we're going to dynamically create each entry in the results array is series information. And for each item in that array, we're going to pull the data out. We're going to pull the title, the image out, and we're going to display it on the page. And for the favorites feature, that's going to be, that's going to use the local storage. That's going to use the local storage of the window. And when they click on the star, I actually added an event listener to the star object. And the star object contains all the attributes that are necessary. So the anime ID, the image ID, the title, and that's gonna be saved to local storage as a JSON object. And then when they click on my list, it's gonna pull from local storage uh, all the data and display it. And one last thing I just wanna go over real quick. Uh, I was pretty proud of some of the animation I had for the results come in because I wanted them to have an animation. So I used the keyframe rules, which allowed my dynamically created DOM elements to actually have an animation. And I can just show real quick that it actually slides up. It's not just, it doesn't just appear. So that is just one little feature that I was proud to put in. And that's basically it. Any questions? Awesome. Thank you so much, Victor. I definitely think it's like the small details that count, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really neat how the one that you're most proud of is the slide up at the animation um, when it's loading. Right? Yeah, that was a little tricky. And then how, how long did it take you to create this project as well? I, a week and a half. Uh, the half week was the half week was planning with the Figma and some of the features, and then the, there was just one week of pure coding. Very nice. And actually, uh, just slightly random question: What's your favorite? One of your favorite animes? <laughs> um, I think I'm gonna go with uh, Gurren Lagann. Oh, I haven't seen that one yet. I'm more into like slice of life. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I, but like you, you did, I think, was it 1979? And so Doraemon was there. And I was like, oh my gosh. It's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Um, any, feel free, if you have a question for Victor, feel free yeah. to put it in the chat. I was going to toss out another reminder there, um, Brian and uh, Victor, for you as well. Don't forget to um, throw the uh, link to your project in the chat. So then that way people can check it out later on. Um, but other than cat, uh, that, Cass, let's uh, keep on moving. And um, if people do have some questions, anybody can, of course, reach out directly or we can connect 
any employers uh, to any of the students that they're interested in. So. Awesome. Thank you so much, Victor. You may now exit the Zoom and yeah. I will let Joseph in. Oh, sorry, uh, Mo. My bad. <laughs> sorry, Joseph. Can you can you exit the, the Zoom? Thank you. I'll let you in in the bit. <laughs> All right, welcome, Mo. Thank right, you for see your you. patience. Um, and you are going to be presenting next. Are you mm -hmm. ready to share your screen? Yeah, give me one second. Awesome, thank you. All right, move this. All right, can you see my screen okay? Yes, we see the code and then also the application. Okay, sounds good. Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Moses Kim, and my app is called What to Eat. I built this app mainly because I always had a hard time deciding what, what to eat whenever I went out with my group of friends. Um, I always wished that there was an app that you can choose your favorite restaurants or whatever your friends were talking about, and then have one chosen for you at that given moment. So on the homepage of the app, you can see that there is a search form. Um, the first uh, input is for the use, it allows the user to input any restaurant by the name or categories of their choice. And the second would be location. Um, right now it's autofilled to my zip code. Um, I'll get into that later when I go into the code. But for example, let's search for um, Boba near me. Um, when the user searches for a restaurant or a category, uh, they'll be shown 20 different search results. Um, this is provided by the Yelp API. And on each search result, there is the restaurant, uh, restaurant uh, name, uh, category, uh, reviews, categories, and address. And when the user clicks on a search result, they'll be taken to a details page where the same information is shown, but also the phone number and um, three pictures provided by the Yelp API as well. And below that, there are three reviews. These are like the top helpful reviews from Yelp. And then below the reviews, there's a map that I implemented using the Google Maps API. I automatically plugged in the user's current location and also the restaurant um, address. And you can see the address is plugged in. I don't wanna click on that one because that is my address. Um, and on the top right of the details page, um, there's a bookmark icon. The, um, the user is able to click on this icon to save this restaurant to a collection that they have previously created. So let's click on it. When the user clicks on it, the, app, uh, the drawer will be shown and the user will be shown their current collections that they have created, shows the collection name, how many places are in that collection, and there's also a save button. Um, another feature is that you can click on the app drawer and then the button will show view because they are not saving at that moment. But for this example, let's save it. And then the bookmark icon will change to a highlighted color to indicate that it is saved. Every time this page is updated, it'll send a request to my server, which uh, checks the database to see if this specific restaurant is saved into any of the user's collections. And to go to a collection, you can hit view. They'll be shown the, the collection with all the restaurants that they saved um, into it. The user can also click on any of these to go back to the details page. But at the top right, this is one of my favorite features. Um, it is a randomizing button where it takes all of the restaurants in this collection only and picks one for you. So here you go. Chose the one we just added, but you can also get out of it and choose again. Okay. <laughs> Twice in a row. Okay. <laughs> Why is it not choosing? Okay, there we go. RNG, am I right? Um, the user can also uh, create a new collection by going here and... Let's type in learning views. Did it for time's sakes, but here you go. And then the, the feature that I'm gonna go over in my code is my geolocation. Um, so in the beginning, you see how this uh, zip code was um, autofilled. Um, the way I do that is that in the app, in the app uh, component, on the component in mount, I check if the user's browser supports getting geolocation. And if it does, then I call the get current position method and then pass in a handle success 
uh, method if the get composition method um, returns a successful like object. And then in the handle success uh, function, um, I get the latitude and longitude from whatever the get current position returns. And then I send the request to my server, um, sending the latitude and longitude as parameters. And then in the server, um, I take the latitude and longitude and I send the request to the Google Maps reverse geocoding API. Um, when I send the request, the API responds with uh, like five addresses that are closest to that latitude and longitude. I take the first one and check if any of the address component types are equal to the postal code because that is what I want. And then once the postal code is, get, um, is given, I send that back to my uh, client. And then in the client, uh, after the server sends it back, I set the state with the latitude longitude and also the zip code. And since the state has changed, triggers a re-render. And I pass down the app state to my home component where, oh, let me move this real quick. <clears throat> um, in the home component, I, um, I pass it down as well to my header down here for location. And in the header, send it down to my search form. And in the search form, um, I check if the, the location prop is given, but I also check whenever it updates. And if it does, then I set this state. And then since the form is a React controlled, um, is React controlled, um, the state will be auto inputted to the form. And that is how I get the geolocation of a user. And that is it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mo. And we actually have a question right off the bat. Even though your random generator um, might is probably truly random, that random button doesn't really do what the user expects. How would you change it to give less surprising behavior to the user? Less surprising behavior to the user? Mm -hmm like that moment where I got like three in a row. Yeah. Mm, maybe like a timestamp or, oh, let's see. Not too sure. For sure. I, I gotta work on that your opportunity to work on it <laughs> yeah. after. Yeah, definitely have more features to work on for this app. Awesome. And what inspired your initial aesthetic as well as, you know, your layout of the Figma as well as the application? Oh, so um, the colorway and like the font, I chose mm -hmm. this because I'm into like mechanical keyboards and there's this keycaps that I really like that uses these colors. So I just chose that. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Great inspiration. And it's very clean, too. Very Thank nice. You. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mo. Don't forget to, like TJ said before, to drop the, the live link um, into the Fairstream chat. That way, everyone can also check out your app as well. Thank you. Thank you. And you may leave the Zoom. Got it. And then our next presenter is going to be Joseph. And he will be zooming in shortly. Awesome. Hello. Welcome, Joseph. Hello. All right. Are you ready to screen share? You, are, you will be presenting next. Yes. I, do you want me to do that right now? Yes, please. All right. Sharing screen number one. Yes, can everyone see, see it? Okay, awesome. Hello, everyone. My name is Joseph, and today I will be demoing my app, Straight Up Chess. And as the name suggests, this is a chess app that allows you to play either locally on a single device or online against other players. And today we'll be demoing how we do it online. And online is best enjoyed uh, with a login. And of course, right now it smells <laughs> that I'm um, presenting, so it chooses not to work. Okay, 
logging in and you actually don't need to log in. And if you don't, you'll just appear as anonymous. But if you do log in, it gives you a, a sweet username and there are other features on the way. So first I'm going to be joining the online lobby. And you can see right now there are no games posted, but I can quickly make a game right now. I decide which side I want to play on and I can leave a little message for my challengers. Can you beat me? And I create the game and that actually updates the lobby for everyone else so they can see your posted game. And when I click on this, it'll actually update the lobby again and remove this post so that no two players can join the same game. And once I join, you can see that the player palettes are populated with the appropriate usernames. So the one that didn't log in was anonymous. And here we have demo. And now we can go over the meat and potatoes of my app, the chess algorithm. And as you would expect, if you click on a piece, it'll highlight where you can possibly move. And if you click outside, it'll unselect. And if you click on one of the highlighted squares, it'll make that move. And now you'll see that it actually updated the other player in real time. This is thanks to the socket IO library, which allows me to do uh, real time bi-directional communication between the clients and the server. And let's just see what happens if I check. And now you can see this king is in check. And if I try to move this pawn, you can see it should be able to move two spaces, but it actually can only move one now. That is because the algorithm that I wrote uh, keeps track of uh, where, where other pieces are, and it checks to see if your king will be in checkmate if you make that move. And if, you, if it is, then it'll actually remove it because that is technically an illegal move. So the only move that we can make is move this pawn forward. And now I just want to show off a few more features. So first of all, when I take a piece, the piece shows up in the corresponding player palette. And also I added some of the more nuanced moves of chess. So for example, castling. And then there's also on passant, which unfortunately we don't have time to go into. And I also have a lot of uh, draw conditions, but they're all really cool. And I wish I had time to go over them. And let's just see what happens if I checkmate. So both players get their, uh, their screens updated with a custom message, depending on the resolution of their game. And then after that, they can either exit back to the lobby or return to game, where they can see the final state of their board. And now going to the code base, I think it'll be easy if I load up a local game so you can sort of follow along. Now, all of the magic for my online game happens in my game component. You can see all the fun methods I have or functions I have here for dealing with all the chess logic. First of all, when you uh, mount the component, it instantiates a socket IO connection. And specifically, it adds the socket to a room corresponding with the game ID. That way, when the two players are making moves back and forth, it's not emitting those moves to everybody who's playing chess. It is just in between those two players. And now what happens when I click? So we go into my handle click method right here. And what we want to focus on is the phase and also what is highlighted. So here you can see the phase is selecting and nothing is highlighted. And when I click, the phase updates to showing options and the highlighted array has the coordinates 35 and 45 corresponding to these two tiles. So what happens is if my phase is selecting, then we call the show options method, which is down here. And what that does is it finds all the possible moves of the pawn. It pushes it to the highlighted array and updates the state accordingly. And now what happens if I click again, the phase is showing options. So I call the decide move method down here. And first of all, if I click on a coordinate that is not in the highlighted array, then it resets the phase to selecting and I can select a new piece. So if I click outside like that, it resets the phase. And now what happens if I click on one of the squares, it makes the move and let's see exactly what's going on when I do that. So first of all, it makes a copy of the board and the game state 
That is because the board and the game state are in the state of the component and we don't want to actually modify them. And instead we call the execute move method on the copy of the board and game state. And that will modify the board to make that move. It also modifies the game state, which has a lot of flags. So for example, for controlling castling, and if a piece was killed, it'll return that piece. So then we can add it to our palettes. And if no shenanigans is going on with any promotions, then we can finally resolve our turn, which involves displaying any banners. And that is the for check, checkmate, or draw. And now we can actually update the other player because right now all of this has happened in just the first client. And the second client is waiting for the data to come in. So we have to get the starting coordinate, the ending coordinate, and if we promote any pawns, what that pawn is going to promote into. And then we send it in a fetch request to the server. And in the server, it emits a move made event through socket IO. And you can see here, the socket has a, an event listener for move made. And the payload of that event happens to have that starting coordinate, ending coordinate, and promotion. So now the other player can do pretty much exactly what just happened. They make a copy of the board and the game state, they execute the move, they record the, any kills that happen, they promote any of the pawns, and they display any banners, and now they are ready to make their move. So that is the basics of my app, and I'm ready for questions. Awesome, very nice job, Joseph. Um, and then what are, what's some of your future, uh, like what are some of your future updates for this? Uh, there's quite a few. I really wanted to add more customization. So right now everybody just gets their own little person avatar, but I really wanna have customization for uh, what the avatar shows and also like the color of the player palette and also like, adding friends and also messaging between friends and challenging friends and seeing uh, your match history and showing the records or, or being able to replay each match. So lots of things in store. Very nice. Uh, and then we have a question from Jacob is, is quote, copy, unquote, your own logic and does it handle deep copy? Um, it is a, it is a deep copy, I believe. Yeah, it's my own, it's my own logic that I made specifically for copying it. Or, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty simple, not that deep. Awesome. And then um, Sky has a question for you. Why did you choose, what did you use to build out the chessboard and animation? Okay, so I'm very glad you asked that question because <laughs> that <laughs> uh, took a while and took a lot of brainstorming to figure out. Uh, let's see, first of all, the board itself is a two-dimensional two div or two-dimensional array of divs. So there are rows of divs and each, each tile is a div by itself. And then it used to be that the pieces were inside each div and that was easily rendered using a map method. But to get the animations right, I actually couldn't use map anymore because it would just delete the piece and render a new piece. So I had to render each piece individually. It's actually in here. So each piece has is rendered individually and when the piece moves, I can update the class. So that is done right here. Let me see if I can just make this bigger. So when the piece uh, moves, I update it by updating the, the class right here. And I have specific classes, board row and board column to position them in the appropriate place. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Joseph. Um, and our you may exit the Zoom and our next presenter will be Solomon. All right, and Solomon is Zooming on in.
please hold in just a moment. Um, Sylvan, can you hear us? Yeah. Awesome. Very neat. Okay. All right, there we go. All right. Are you ready to share your screen? You'll be presenting next. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Give me a second. Okay. Is that visible? Mm -hmm. Yes. We see your application as well as your code. Okay. So uh, am I online live right now? Do I begin? Oh, yeah. You can start. Oh. Sorry. You can start. <laughs> Thank right. you. I'm so sorry. Uh, OK, hello, my name is Solomon Jin. I'm a full stack web developer. Um, and this is an app I made during my time at Learning Fuse called Live Search for Reddit. And as the name suggests, it allows um, users to perform live searches on Reddit and also receive notifications um, for any newly posted submissions that are found that match the search criteria. And I got the idea for this app because um, on Reddit, there are these subreddits that act as marketplaces for certain hobbies. So uh, over time got to be a real pain for me to check every day or every few hours for items of interest to pop up. So I ended up uh, making an app that, you know, I leave a search running and I'm confident that if it does pop up, I'll be notified and I'll be able to, you know, snipe that item. So uh, this here is my app. And um, because the app does uh, perform actions on behalf of the user, it does require the user to sign in. So we're gonna go ahead and press sign in. And it uses uh, OAuth to allow the user to sign in via Reddit. So once the user is signed in, we're going to go ahead and start a search description. So we're going to go ahead and look for the keywords test and hello in the subreddit testing ground for bots, because I don't want to, uh, you know, bombard some random subreddit with like, you know, test stuff. So uh, uh, the keywords in the subreddits can have as many different keywords and subreddits as you want, as long as it's separated by commas. And this thing here is a little toggle switch that when enabled does two things. The first being that any newly found submission that matches the search criteria will now be sent to the user uh, in the form of a Reddit private message, which we'll see in a second. And the second thing is that uh, when this is enabled and the user is disconnected from the app entirely, um, it would the server will run a, a background search every 10 minutes via the Heroku scheduler. And it will do a one-off search with every user's search terms and find any search results um, uh, relevant to their search, search subscriptions and send it in the form of a Reddit private message as well to each user. Um, so we're going to go ahead and uh, enable that and start our search. So we are currently looking for any post in the subreddit testing ground for bots with the keywords hello and test. So I pre-filled out this form. We're going to go ahead and submit a uh, text post. So it's submitted. It's taken a second. Oh, oops, I'm sorry. I uh, typoed it. I typoed the uh, subreddit. Sorry about that. I need to do another submission. So hello, this is a test. And there we go, it found the submission and uh, it shows us a little card. The user can click on it to reveal the body content inside. And here we have three little buttons. The first being a private message button. So when the user clicks on this, uh, they're shown a little form in the little Moto dialog. And the user is able to send a private message to the author of this thread. So we're gonna go ahead and send a private message. And then we're also going to, uh, the second button uh, allows the user to leave a comment on the thread. So we're gonna say hello. And then this third and final button just opens the thread in a new tab so they can be brought to it directly. So we're gonna refresh the page and wait for, there we go, the comment that I just sent a second ago appeared in the thread. And if we check our inbox, you can see the uh, message I sent to myself a second ago is in my inbox, as well as the submission itself was found and sent to my inbox. So that's, um, the main feature I wanted to show off. So we'll go ahead and jump to the code base. Um, and uh, as you can see, the entire front end of the app is built using um, 
React and Material UI. Um, and the server side is a mixture of Node.js, Express, as well as Socket.io. So I want to go over the code real quick of what happens when the user presses this search button. So this here is the search form component. And in it, there is a form that um, when, uh, when the form is submitted, the submit search function will run. And it's actually been passed down from the app component via context. And it is right here. So when this submit search function runs, um, it does a couple things. The first is it creates a, uh, constructs a query string, um, as you can see here, or well, I canceled the search, but for to start the search again, you can see the query string. It creates a query string using the user's inputs. And then since I'm using React Router to uh, handle the navigation of the app, of the pages, uh, it also gives me access to this really convenient use history hook. Uh, which has this push method that allows you to um, push query strings or URLs onto the history stack. And the other important thing in this method or the function is the set is searching here. Uh, so we're going to um, set the is searching state to the value of the query string we just constructed. And when that happens, when the is searching um, state is updated, this use effect hook runs. And uh, it simply will just gather the uh, inputs from the query string and validate them, and then attempt to make a uh, WebSocket connection with the server via socket IO. So if we jump to the socket side or server side, um, we start right here. This is basically the um, authentication middleware for my socket connections. It will basically just check every socket connection request to see if it contains a cookie. Um, containing a JSON web token. And when the JSON web token is verified, it will have uh, user information stored inside, which um, the server will take to query the database with and then uh, retrieve the user's refresh token. And the important part is right here. With the refresh token, um, I'm using uh, an NPM package called SNU wrap, which is a JavaScript wrapper for the uh, Reddit API to construct a Reddit requester object. And then I'm going to just pass the information along down the middleware stack. So when the socket connection makes the connection, um, it's going to create uh, the search stream, which is basically just a polling. Uh, it's going to pull the Reddit API every few seconds to see if there are any new submissions. And then down here, it's going to check to see if any of those submission titles matches the keywords. And if it does, it's going to emit a new submission event back to the client. So if we go back to the client, it's listening for any new submission events that uh, when there is a new submission event, we're just going to add it to the, um, or create a new array and uh, add the submission to the, at the beginning of the array, as well as copy as any uh, uh, older results. And um, when the search results state is updated, it will cause the page to re-render and um, each submission will be displayed as a little card as shown here. So that about sums it up for, the, um, app, for my app. Um, if I had time, there are some features I would have liked to implement. Um, for example, there is, uh, I would have liked to have uh, users uh, access their inbox from the app directly, um, and as well as compose and send any private messages. But fortunately, I didn't quite have time, so I'm looking forward to implementing those in the future. So um, that about sums it up. If uh, there are any questions, I'll be gladly try to answer them. Thank you for listening. Awesome. Great job, Sullivan. And um, Mo said that he uses your app um, for his keyboard have hobby and it makes it super convenient. That's good to hear. <laughs> and then Jacob asked, are there any concerns with blocking or need for proxies? Um, as far as I know, no. But my um, the only people who have been using it are like me and my couple of my friends so um uh it hasn't really been stress tested in in that way but it on paper i feel like it should be fine nice and then uh don't forget to also post the live link um mm -hmm. into the fair stream chat that way everyone else can also access it as well okay thank you Thank you so much, Solomon. Um, and then we will be having, you may exit the Zoom and I'll be having Daniel present next.
Awesome. Welcome, Daniel. Awesome. Can you hear me? All right. Um, and then are you ready to share your screen? Oh, I think you're muted. All right, there we go. And then, wait, can you hear us? Sorry, I was yeah. muted. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no worries, no worries. All right, you're up next to present. You may start presenting, thank you. Hi guys, my name is Daniel Toe. I'm a full stack web developer. Um, this is my app that I created during my time at Learning Views. Um, this is a phishing app that I kind of thought of a long time ago now. Um, I've had this idea when I had a fishing tournament with a couple of my friends where we would fish and whoever got the most fish would win at the end of the year. So I thought this would be a great idea and I took the opportunity to make Reelin. Um, Reelin is a fishing app for all, anyone who loves to fish, anyone who likes to compete against other people. It's made with React uh, JS for front end and in the back end it's uh, it uses Node.js with Ex Express.js for all backend server requests. So when the user first opens the app, they'll be brought to this um, uh, sign-in page. If they need to sign up for an account, they can go over here to fill it, this out. But let me go ahead and uh, sign in for this account registered already. Wrong password, I think. There we go. Uh, once they're signed in, they're always going to be signed in thanks to JWT, JSON Web Tokens, which gets saved into the local storage. And um, the user sessions persist even through uh, closing and opening the app. So this is the home page, which shows the uh, information about the app and how to use the app. And at, at the bottom, there's a featured video. Now I'm going to go over to the attorneys page, which shows all of the tournaments that have been created. Uh, you can go to see the past tournaments, current tournaments, and open tournaments. Um, down here at the bottom, you can click Create Tournament, which brings you to this form. You can fill out, um, name a tournament, on, and all the information you might need to know for the tournament and Create Tournament button down here. But I'm going to go back into this tournament page and check out this, uh, this tournament that's already been created with 10 people participating in it. Uh, here's the leaderboard with uh, first place at, at the very top. And at the very bottom, you have last place. Down here at the, the rules overview, you can see the name, or you can see uh, when it starts and when it ends, and who hosted the tournament with uh, you know, all the rules down here. If you go up a little bit to recent catches, you can check all the logged, logged catches that people have logged. Um, you can click on one of the cards to see a little bit more details. Um, and let's say a, a someone, a user catches a fish, they'll want to log it to this tournament. Uh, they'll, they'll be brought here, which they can log a picture of the, of the fish uh, when it was caught. Um, you can leave this blank if you like, if it's um, not applicable, but I'm going to make this 200 pounds and I'll submit it. Um, once you submit it, you can uh, you can log in another fish if you wish. But I'm going to go back and check out my catch. And it looks like that catch brought me all the way up to the first place. And here's my fish. So uh, also, this app is fully responsive. So you can use this on your phone if you like. Because um, it's much better to be using this on your phone, I believe. I'm going to go ahead and go over to VS Code. Uh, Here's the app which handles everything. Um, oh, wait, hold on, Daniel. I don't think your VS code is showing if you just want to reshare your screen. Because uh, right now it's just the uh, mobile version. Oh, did it change? I'll see your code. Oh, you can just unshare. You can just stop sharing and okay. just share the screen with your code. <clears throat> yeah. And feel free to share again. OK. We can see your code now. Does this? Mm -hmm. Good. OK. Uh, this is AppJS, uh, which handles all of the routing. So it can go to home, the authenticator for sign in and sign up, 
uh, the tournaments in, in the render method, um, you can see that there's context that, that gets um, passed on to every single component in, in this app uh, with uh, the context provider. Uh, for instance, in log catch component, this gets passed down. Oh, I think this is the wrong version, but uh, uh, the user user data would be passed in here, um, which be, or the route would be passed into here, which would take the tourney ID and make a simple fetch request and uh, and get the information about the tournament here. Uh, down here, you can see that this log uh, log catch component uh, renders a form with four inputs: a file input, a date input and two number of inputs. And all of this is saved into a form data object. And because the reason why I use a form data is because I use a uh, uploads middleware um, right here, which is powered by Molter. It's, Molter is a Node.js file uploads uh, middleware that handles all image uploads. And how it works is it saves all the images or it searches in the uh, form data objects for all images and saves it into this, uh, this directory right here and renames it to image dash in a series of numbers like, so image dash numbers. Um, I'm gonna go over to the index.js for all the uh, backend stuff. Up here is the authentication and you, um, the user will not be able to use the app without uh, signing in and signing up. Down here, this is the, um, the endpoint for posting or uh, logging their catch, it, it'll take that form data and it'll also take that image fo uh, file and um, query a SQL request to insert it in. And if that's successful, we go back into the log catch component and make one more fetch request, uh, which adds to the score. It's a simple calculation, just the weight times points per pound. And through that, it does another query uh, request and adds the score to the previous score. And that's my app. Thanks for listening. I'll take any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much. I think my favorite part is that for the profile picture, you can actually use a GIF. Um, yeah. I saw some <laughs> I like of that. that I thought too. that was super neat. Very nice. And I'm just going to wait a quick minute for questions. But also, what are your future um, for updates for this application? Uh, some of my stretch features is, uh, my next one is to add a chat. I do have one in another version where I have it client side working, but I do wanna impl implement Socket.io for the bi-directional communication. Um, that's coming up soon. And I, I would also like to have uh, users be able to exit or leave a tournament. Right now they're stuck until the end of it or forever. <laughs> And yeah, those are my two features that I want, I want to add. Awesome. Hopefully you'll be able to use this in your next fishing trip. <laughs> <laughs> TJ. Yeah, I uh, wanted to jump in there. Definitely um, one of my favorite presentations to watch, seeing the, the gifts and the photos. Um, and then also, of course, the leaderboard and who you decided to put up top and then <laughs> down below. I'm glad that my name wasn't on that list. Uh, but Couple of things I wanted to do. I, um, I'm going to go ahead and post um, some of the student LinkedIn's in the chat, so that if anybody's interested in connecting with them, um, you can find them there. And then we also have a hiring platform. So for anybody who is hiring currently or later on, you can go sign up, create an account, and then see any uh, alumni who are actively in the job search see their profiles, um, look at their LinkedIn, look at their GitHub, and then also reach out and even schedule interviews uh, if that is something that you're interested in. Uh, and then the final thing I wanted to note and you know, once again, just thank is the uh, Fairstream team and Skylar and Alicia who are here with us. Um, we got connected to them a few months ago and when we first kind of heard about this opportunity to promote our events on, you know, a platform kind of similar to Eventbrite, but then at the same time host them, um, as you guys are all seeing through uh, Fairstream, we were really excited. But I think one of the coolest things about them is that their company's focus is on diversity and inclusion hiring. 
So if anybody in the audience is also looking to increase that, hopefully you'll start with us. But if we don't have the right student or fit, um, then I think Fairstream is a great partner um, to be exploring and looking at there. So just wanted to throw that out there for everybody. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Daniel, so much for your um, presentation. Um, you can stop screen sharing now. And then, yeah, don't forget to also post the live link um, to your application in the Fairstream chat so that everyone can also use it for their next fishing trip. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah. Thank you, everyone, so much. We will be, this is the end of our demo day. Um, and we just want to thank you all so much for your participation, as well as your questions. And we hope to see you next time. Oh, yeah, TJ, did you have any final thoughts to add after? That is it. We, we ended right on time, too. When, does, when do events do that? Oh, no, we're too late. Okay, we should get off before. <laughs>